Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, our program this afternoon. My name is Jamie McDowell, and I am the branch manager here at the Fairview Public Library. I want to thank the Friends of the Fairview Library for their sponsorship of this program and their sponsorship of so many programs that we do here at the library. We certainly wouldn't be able to do what we do without the Friends of the Library, so thank you to them. A couple of quick round rules that I'm going to lay out before we get started here. Um, everyone's camera and microphone has been disabled, so the only person you'll be able to see this afternoon is our wonderful presenter, Ruth Gonzalez. Um, the chat feature has also been disabled, but we will be doing a Q&A at the end if we have time. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you will see a little icon that says Q&A. If you have any questions for Ruth, go ahead and click on that, type your questions in there, and we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. Um, and you can type your questions in any time um, throughout the program. So if you have something and you don't wanna forget it, go ahead and put it in there. Uh, we won't lose it, we'll make sure to get to it. This program is being recorded today. So if you would like an encore presentation or if you know somebody that wasn't able to make it live but is still interested in the content, we will put it on the library's YouTube channel sometime uh, by the end of this week or early next week. And we will send that link out to all of our attendees today. So that's where you'll be able to access it there. And that's all I have to say. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here. I want to welcome Ruth Gonzalez. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's such a pleasure to be with all of y'all today. And I kind of wish I could see you, but um, that's all right. So my name is Ruth Gonzalez and I work at Reams Creek Nursery. And um, we're gonna be talking about digging a little deeper into gardening. We're going to start off with some of the reasons that gardening is so good for you and so wonderful in so many ways. And then we're going to talk about engaging the senses a little more in ways that we can um, engage our senses more out in our gardens. And then also um, we're gonna um, have some slides toward the, the last third of the program. We'll be talking about just ways to assess your garden, things to think about that you might add or subtract from your garden to make it a happier place to be. Um, and I think we could go ahead as long as y'all are ready and start, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and start my PowerPoint, okay? Okay. So digging into gardening. And we're gonna jump right in with the benefits of nature. And I actually loved doing some of the research for this. I, I found out some things I didn't even know. So some of the benefits of nature, lower rates of stress, anxiety, and depression, a boosted immune defense and anti-cancer effects, increased energy, and improved sleep, lowered blood pressure and reduced inflammation in the body, a reduced risk of obesity. And I actually, uh, a little sidetrack on that, I, one thing I read about obesity was that, um, or not even obesity, just weight, that by going out at a certain time of day every day without doing anything else, um, there was weight loss involved and it, 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 we'll talk about it in this another slide, but an, an accelerated recovery from surgery and lower rates of preterm labor, asthma and nearsightedness. So I think when you think about where we humans feel most comfortable, it's important to realize that for most of humankind's existence, we have been outdoors. For most of our existence, we didn't even have built shelter. And I mean, a crude built shelter. For most 
of our existence, we didn't have agriculture in any form. And so if you look at, at this chart here, it was 2.8 million years ago when the earliest humans, when we have um, discovered remains of the earliest humans. 176,000 years ago are when they have signs of the first built structures. That is, it took us a really long time as the human race to start even making a crude structure. And then it took another giant chunk of time before we started um, agriculture. And by that, that marker is just designating throwing out a few grain seeds. It's not what we think of as agriculture today with tractors and plowed fields and all of that thing. It's just kind of manipulating your environment a little bit to gather seed and throw them out. That's simple, 11,500 years ago. So think about that 11,500 years ago, then the next increment here is the industrial revolution starting in 1780. Well, that's just a few years after our country declared its independence. So that's not very long in the scheme of things. It's a mere eye blink, if even an entire eye blink um, that the industrial revolution has taken hold. So humankind before that has been mostly outside. Um, they had an exhibit at the Arboretum a number of years ago that talked about the footprint of housing and how many, the size of people's houses at a certain year. And so maybe in the 1800s, maybe around 1955 and now, and they compared the number of people living in those houses. So they had very small houses in the 1800s, maybe they were 12 by 12 or something that had a large family living in that house. And um, so you can imagine that most of their time was spent outdoors. They were raising food, they were getting firewood, they were tending to animals and all that kind of thing. So as the industrial revolution came along, we did start spending more time indoors. And I think it would be safe to say that we are spending more and more and more time indoors so this last thing, 32 years ago, invention of the World Wide Web, and I would say so many of us now, including myself, spend way too much time on our devices, whether that's our phones, our iPads, our computers, um, but and many of us work at a desk and come home and still get on a, a device for the remainder of the day. And that's not really how we're built as human beings, that's just such a, uh, a consequence, a very, a recent consequence of humankind. So exposure to morning sunlight profoundly affects mood, health, and nighttime sleep. Outdoor light, even on a cloudy day, delivers considerably more lux than indoor light, even those special indoor lights. Rainy winter days will produce lux levels of a thousand or more, which is far greater than any inside light will produce. And on a sunny summer day, sunlight can deliver light that is 1000 times brighter than indoor light. So getting out in that light, light comes in through our eyes and I only learned this a couple of days ago, that the eyes are the second most complex organ in the body after the brain with over 2 million working parts. I found that just astounding. So exposure to early morning sunlight before noon and an, another um, parameter that I read about was between six o'clock and nine o'clock in the morning. And um, that particular research said that if you were just out even 15 minutes in the morning, that was going to be very, very helpful. It helps you sleep at night. It establishes circadian rhythms 
and the circadian rhythms are like the rhythms of our, our human existence. So if you get up in the morning and immediately go outside, that is signaling your body with the light that it's taking in through your eyes that the day has begun. And at the end of the day, your body's going to be ready for rest. Um, it also sends a wake up call to the pituitary gland, which releases regulating hormones and signals the hypothalamus, which coordinates and regulates most of our life sustaining functions and also initiates and directs our reactions to stress, which many of us are dealing with added levels of stress just by virtue of our modern human existence. Why nature is beneficial is not entirely clear. Some suspect that natural stimuli, the swaying trees, rushing water, and singing birds might reset our fight or flight response, which is too often switched into overdrive by the stresses of urban modern life. That rest in turn gives the body psychological, digestive, and immune systems the break they need to perform normally. So just going outdoors is doing these really good things for your body. Just going outdoors, not even going into your garden, just going outdoors. Um, there's been a lot of research in recent, recent years about the effects of nature, the benefits of nature, how children are affected. Um, I think there's a book called The Last Child Indoors or Outdoors. That's a great book. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact title correct. But they talk in that book about nature deficit disorder. It's actually a named condition. And it's actually being that they are actually prescribing people to go out into nature to improve various conditions. Um, attention deficit disorder is one and another one is depression. So they did one study where um, girls, and I'm not sure why it was girls, maybe that was just the parameters of this particular study, but when they were doing their homework, if their, their desk was by a window and they could see out the window, if they could see nature outside the window, their um, attention to their homework was improved. I mean, that's amazing. So doctors are prescribing part, part prescriptions and there really and truly is a part prescription program with the National Park Service. In Japan, forest bathing, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that, Shinrin Yoku. And this is basically just going out into nature and enjoying nature. This isn't exercising in nature, this is just walking in a natural environment and enjoying that natural space. Within 15 minutes, cortisol, blood pressure, and heart rate all improved, just walking in nature. Another great study said that, um, this was done in Europe, that people who experience at least 14 different bird species in their daily life are happier. And um, they even re correlated it to, it was $150 a week worth of extra happiness that if you had gotten 150 extra dollars in your paycheck. So, um, so the power of your garden is there. It's waiting for you. Even if you haven't developed your garden that much yet, the power of your garden is right there just all you have to do is walk outside and enjoy your yard at whatever state it's currently in. It's going to bring you additional physical health, mental health, and beauty, and a sense of your particular place, a sense of kind of um, ownership, or maybe a better word would be stewardship of your particular little piece of ground. So I repeated this slide just in case you wanted to see it again with all the, the benefits that we're getting by going outdoors. And um, now we're going to start into the section about engaging your senses. 
So each of the five senses, when we walk every day, all day, we're engaging our senses. Um, but what are some particular ways that we might think about in our garden? So the first one we'll talk about our eyes, sight. So when you walk out into your garden or outdoors anywhere and you see the birds flying around, the butterflies flitting around, or you're out at night and the fireflies are rising up, it just gives you a really positive feeling to see that. So if there are things you can do in your garden to help generate that, that's just gonna bring you more pleasure. Color, when we look outside, what are the colors that we see? The colors of the blooms, the colors of the foliage, colors of container gardens you may have around your house, and even things like your shutters or the trim on your house that may relate to various plants. So um, I bought a hydrangea a couple of years ago that was the most beautiful periwinkle color. And I thought, oh my gosh, I think I just wanna buy a bunch of different plants that are this color and then paint my shutters that color. Well, so far the only thing I've done is plant the hydrangea, but <laughs> I've got big dreams. Um, so texture, contrasting foliage shapes, contrasting flower shapes, hardscaping, mulch. So foliage shapes, when you look at this picture on the slide, look at all that foliage that is just incredible. There's grass-like foliage, there's polka dotted foliage, there's veined foliage, there's very dark foliage and purple foliage and bright green foliage, all with different leaf shapes, different leaf forms. I can see some ferns tucked in here, here and there. And this is, um, there are very little there's a little coral bell flower in that picture, but for the most part, we're looking just at leaf texture and look how beautiful that is. Um, another thing to think about is your hardscaping and how that can really um, change the vibe. In other words, I have a kind of a, in my house, I have a sort of a funky little sidewalk that came with the house that's right up against the house. And it's very scrunchy feeling and it's a little bit broken down feeling like it needs repair. And so at my house, I made a, a different entryway to my front door that was a little more graceful. So it was a curved pathway that just it has um, stone, stepping stones, very simple to make, but it did change the vibe. And things like mulch, the, the mulch is going to provide texture to your garden. And the choice of mulch that you use is going to provide texture, let's say shredded mulch versus, versus um, pine bark nuggets, that kind of thing. So the sky, when you walk outside, immediately we're going to use the sky really to tell us about what the day is gonna be like. Is it gonna be rainy? Is it sunny? Is it clear? Are there clouds? What's going on outside? We get so much information from just walking out and looking at the sky and we really take that for granted. And of course, um, sunrises, sunsets, star watching, watching the moon rise. Are there ways that you can invite those kind of things in? Do you have a deck? Do you have a space somewhere in your yard that would be particularly um, nice for including the sky? The other thing too is that if you have um, a pool of water or a bird bath, a lot of times, a lot of times that will reflect the sky to you in your garden and add another dimension that way. Um, thinking about shapes that you're going to see when you walk into your garden. Well, there could be the shapes of your flower beds. Your flower beds might be straight lines. Maybe they were put together with those um, railroad ties, or maybe it's a nice curvy line. But also other there's other shapes in your garden, the shapes of your bushes, the shapes of your trees, the shapes of each flower clump. What are, what are those like? And think about how those all fit together. 
other things we're going to see when we walk into our gardens are different kinds of art, sculpture, pottery, um, the lighting that we may choose to add to our, that could be as simple as um, Christmas lights, that could be lights hung up over a, a, an area outdoors where we like to sit and chat with our friends. Um, or it could be a beautiful sculpture. It could be one of the, the wind sculptures, anything like that. And the other thing with your eyes, think about your short range view, your long range view and how it looks from indoors. So the short range view might be, let's say if you have a fence, your eye is going to be stopped by that fence. So that's an opportunity for a flower bed or to um, frame a piece of art or put a bench in something like that. Your long range views, I think we should probably all look around. I know at Reams Creek Nursery, we get so used to working here that we don't even see it, but we really have some pretty long range views right sitting here from my window, I can see the mountains this way. And if I walk out the back door, I just see a beautiful mountain range. So if there's a way, if you have a long range view, try to think about how you might be able to liberate that view, how you might be able to frame that view. And if you wanna place um, things in your garden in a strategic way to really enjoy that view. And, and the last part is from indoors. So I think it's really important when you're planning your garden that you think about, you go and look out of all of your windows. What are you seeing out of each one of those windows? And is there something that you can do to kick it up a notch where you're seeing? But if there's a particular chair or spot Let's say in the winter you sit in a particular chair and you snuggle up with a book and drink your tea. Well, what's outside that window? Maybe that would be a strategic place for a bird feeder or wind chimes that you'd be able to hear. Or maybe on the, in the summertime when you're gonna have a lot of flowers blooming, maybe you sit on your porch or maybe you sit in that same chair. Maybe that's where you put your pollinator garden so that um, you can really maximize your enjoyment of that gardening space, even from indoors. Um, and here's just a couple of examples. Here's a nice curvy pathway. You're greeted by this piece of artwork that's a bell when you walk in. There's a gate that you have to go through that creates some mystery. And um, I'm not sure if y'all can see my pointer, but um, there are evergreen plants along the way as you walk along that pathway. There's a vine over the gate. There's all kinds of elements in this garden that have added some interest. And if you look at the picture on, on the right side, you can see this looks to be a pretty narrow passageway of stairs from one level to another, but look at everything they've done to really make that spot special. They've added a bench with some plants and pretty in pretty planters. They've added lots of very warm, cozy looking lighting. They've added that kind of bird cagey thing and they've allowed some of the viney greenery to kind of grow across the steps. It just makes it a pleasurable, um, travel from the top to the bottom of these stairs. So thinking about your sound. So when you walk out and you hear the birds singing, you hear the birds chattering at each other, you hear uh, bees buzzing, you hear the flutter of the hummingbird wings. These all can make you so happy. The first year I moved up here, I thought spring would never come. And I walked outdoors one day and I, I couldn't see them, but I could hear in the top of the maple trees. They don't, they just look bare still, but they actually have flowers and the bees were making so much noise. They were so, visiting all the flowers. So frogs and crickets, cicadas, some people like to just have a little water around just so they'll have frogs or 
we have, for instance, um, bullfrog tadpoles. Well, what a great sound, a bullfrog. And think about the rustling of the wind in the trees. Think about the rustling of the wind through grasses that you may have left up for winter interest and what that adds and tells you about the outdoor world. Wind chimes, bells, all of these things. My friend has an octagonal house and she's got wind chimes and bells all over the place and she can kind of tell which way the wind is blowing just by which bell or wind chime is ringing. So the sound of children playing, to me, that's a wonderful sound that if I can hear that, it's not normally in my yard, but I love hearing that in the distance. The sound of water you can incorporate into your garden by fountains, by, uh, if you have a creek, I mean, that's even better, but there are, are a number of ways that you could create a fountain that's pretty easy. Even the sound of gravel just crunching under your feet. Sounds that aren't great, leaf blowers, weed eaters, traffic. Um, so there are strategies you could use to sort of buffer those sounds. I know in my neighborhood, I had at least two neighbors that did uh, use to leaf blowers every single day for about three weeks. So it, it's definitely not the sound of silence. Um, but uh, for instance, if you have traffic from the highway, you may be able to um, do a screen that, uh, that actually helps buffer that sound so that you're not feeling right up against it. Beautiful picture of wind chimes and just the buzzing of bees, watching bees, hearing bees. It's just always a fun, a fun um, experience when you can feel like there's life going on in your garden. And of course, your nose. Everyone loves fragrant flowers. Everyone loves the smell of roses, um, some other fragrant flowers. Sweet alyssum is a very low growing very, very sweet smelling flower, dianthus or pinks, hyacinths, lilies, garden phlox, peony, lily of the valley, all of those are, are wonderful. Um, and thinking about all the herbs, any herb, almost any culinary herb is going to smell good. Basil, rosemary, lavender, sage, mint, the different times lemon verbena, all of these are very fragrant. And the first year I planted basil, this is years ago, decades ago, I didn't know really how to use basil at the time. I just thought, I'm, thought I would plant some and I just happened to plant it at the bottom of my steps. And I thought to myself after that season that even if I never used it to eat, just brushing against it and having that smell be emitted as I walked up my steps was worth planting basil. Um, fragrant trees and shrubs, clethras one, that's also called um, summer sweet, itea, it's called uh, sweet spire, lilacs, fragrant viburnums, button bush, daphne, that one's a little picky. The, um, at least a couple of the magnolias, the magnolia grandiflora, the one with the big white blooms with the evergreen leaves. Witch hazel is blooming right now. And it's not really fragrant if it's cold out, but if, if the weather turns toward more moderate, it will be fragrant. Roses, gardenia, and even some of our, um, a lot of the, just the foliage, Green Giant Arborvitae has a super pleasant smell. Arizona Cypress has a really pleasant smell. Um, and it's another kind of harking back to nature and our relationship to nature. This smell of soil actually does release endorphins for us as human beings. That's pretty cool. Other smells you might smell in your garden, smell of smoke from your fire pit, the smell of supper cooking on the grill, smells you may wanna think about where do you strategically wanna place those smells like 
compost and garbage cans. It may be that you're not gonna wanna put a sitting area right next to your compost pile. So I just uh, mentioned Clethra. This is a super fragrant. This particular one is a small, maybe three to four foot bush, very highly fragrant and pollinators absolutely love it. This is the sweet alyssum. It's a very short flower. And I, um, I never used to plant this because I thought it would poop out in the heat, but I planted some last year and it did not poop out and it was still hanging in there in November. I was just amazed. And it took me a while to, I kept smelling this really sweet smell when I was sitting outside. And it took me a while to figure out it was alyssum. I, I don't know why, because it was sort of low and just, it didn't, wasn't screaming for attention. Of course, something like hyacinths are just super fragrant and a wonderful way to start the spring. Okay, so I hope in this group, there are some people who like to grow vegetable gardens and there's nothing quite as wonderful as going out into your own yard and picking fresh vegetables that you're going to make into dinner that day or that you're going to put up or that you're going to, to um, share with your neighbors. So culinary herbs, we've mentioned them just a minute ago, but of course, all of these culinary herbs are awesome. I love being able to just, walk, I walk right out my front door and during the season can easily cut parsley, rosemary, cilantro, thyme. I think I'm forgetting a couple, but I definitely recommend planting them very close to your door. So in the middle of dinner, you can run out there and pick what you need. Um, edible flowers, things like nasturtiums, Johnny Jump Ups, pansies. There are a lot of calendula. There are a lot of edible flowers. Um, so the other part about growing these, these vegetables right in your yard is you can really just taste the vitality. When you go out there and cut some fresh lettuce or some fresh spinach or anything really, but especially those greens, they taste so full of vitamins and so delicious. So here's just a beautiful garden for a little inspiration. You can see he's got raised beds. He's got this canopy going with, it looks like maybe, um, some kind of squash, maybe delicata squash or something like that. And um, what a lovely garden this is. So think about making your vegetable garden a place you wanna hang out as well as your ornamental garden. The other thing to think about, I have a note here that just reminded me orientation to the sun. So if you are gonna have a big arbor or you're gonna have your beans growing up a, a, a fence or something like that, you do wanna think about which way is north and plan your garden in such a way that that tall vine is not going to be blocking the sun from your other vegetables because most vegetables need full sun to thrive. So, touch. So plant textures like lamb's ear, you can see in the left hand side, ferns, grasses that are saw sawtoothed, um, smooth bark, bumpy bark, smooth and furry stems. Um, and that touch that then releases fragrance into the air. The other thing is thinking about when you're sitting outside, um, how nice it is to create a spot that's warm and out of the wind in the winter. And then how nice it is to have a place to sit that's in the shade in the summer. And if you're sitting in the shade in the winter, you're probably going to feel cold. And if you're sitting in the sun in the summer, you're gonna be looking for some shade. So you, you you know, it's good to devise a couple of different sitting areas so that you've always got a sweet place to sit. The winds in the winter, you're gonna want protection from the wind. 
at some point we're going to have some nice gentle breezes that are warm breezes and we're love that and then i can always feel in august just a slight chill in the air that's telling me that fall is on its way so these are ways that our body back to all the different hundreds of thousands of millions of years we spent outside as human beings these are clues our body is very tuned into think about your garden furniture how it feels to sit down on a stone bench versus a metal bench versus a wood bench and um, also how wet those benches might stay for how long so those are some considerations when you're planning where to put a bench and what's on the ground is it grass is it hardscaping like in this picture where they've got a little um, sort of a dry stream bed running through a patio area and then of course another thing that if you're in the garden working if your tools are working well, that just is a real pleasure. Here's a couple of pictures that show you some contrasting areas that the one on the left is a very modern vibe. It's very simple planting. You can see a wooden deck and then gravel and just a very simple modern pot with the big grass in it. But it is under some shade. So it looks like a comfortable spot to hang out when it's summertime and the one next door is looks like a very very warm cozy spot because there's a big tall brick wall or the corner of the house where this bench is sited and the the brick pathway that goes up to the bench um, that's going to make for a very nice warm protected spot and as, you, as you're walking up that pathway, it looks like there's lavender. It looks like there's some very nice fuzzy plants if we're thinking about texture and all that good stuff. So let's just assess our gardens a little bit and ways that we might maximize our enjoyment. And I'm just gonna ask you to look at this picture for a second because in this picture, you can see there's a nice sitting area under a shady tree. You can see further out in the sun, there's at least two chairs that are in a sunny spot in the yard in the grass. Um, and I think when I was looking at this picture up close, there's another one, another chair that's in that area behind that ball shaped plant. So there's lighting that's strung up in the trees that's adding another element. There's a repetition of these ball shapes. So it looks like there's three or four little boxwoods and then a big tall boxwood on the left-hand side. But even beyond that, there's more ball shapes. And then on the right-hand side, there's even more ball shapes. So that, that repetition is kind of carrying you and leading you through the garden and providing evergreen structure. So when every, all the leaves fall off, in the winter time, I can see a number of evergreens in this picture, including those boxwood balls. And imagine that you are inside that house. You can see there's a, a row of windows here looking straight out into this garden and how beautiful that would be because you're gonna, you're gonna include that view when you're sitting indoors. So gardening for good, I am a big proponent of organic gardening and a lot of the people on our staff, not all, but most of us garden organically. We really um, believe in paying attention to uh, adding chemicals to, to the planet, okay? And, um, and also for the safety of your family too, but so, Gardening for good, I think it's good for the soul, it's good for the planet, it's good for the wellness of your family and your pets. If, if there are chemicals on the ground and your children and your pets are rolling around on it, that's not gonna be good for them. Um, you might think about having less grass and more garden because when you have more garden, you're gonna be creating some habitat for wildlife. I'm not totally dissing grass, I think grass also 
offers benefits. Um, definitely there are things that are living in the grass, but in addition to that, um, a grassy area can provide other things that you can sit in the grassy area. Children can play in the grass. You can play, grown-ups can play in the grass. You can play games in the grass. So you do want to protect your soil, which is a valuable resource. So you're, you're gonna wanna use mulch or, or plant enough plants that your soil, the roots of your plants are holding your soil in place. Um, by choosing not to use chemicals in your yard and by choosing to plant native plants, you can really help both the birds and the pollinators. So I um, didn't incorporate this slide, but there has been a 25% songbird decline in the last 50 years. That means a quarter of the songbirds. And as far as the pollinators, um, we've probably heard about pollinator collapse disorder. We know that pollinators are struggling. We, they had a report from Germany that they were calling an insect apocalypse, which said there were maybe 70% less insects in the particular areas of the study in Germany. So when you plant Habitat for Wildlife, you are really doing a good thing. And um, I have to say in my own yard, I expanded my pollinator garden last year. And it's just astounding that when you add, there, there wouldn't have been the number of pollinators and butterflies and this and that visiting my grass if I had, did not have this pollinator garden right there. So it was just such a pleasure for me garden organically and garden regeneratively. So gardening organically, that's the first step and gardening regeneratively is even going one step further where you're really trying to add to, you're trying to add to the habitat, add to the soil, add to what you're contributing to the planet. Um, there's something called the dark sky concept, and that is that, and there are even some national parks are dark sky parks. There are, if you go to Lowe's to buy a porch light, some of them are certified dark sky, which means they point down a certain way. So they're less disruptive to insects and things like that. Um, I went to a talk a few days ago where um, Brian Tompkins was talking about dark sky in regard to loss, loss of insect. And that's because the, the light attracts a lot of flying insects. And, and so when they're buzzing around the light, they're not feeding. And if they're not feeding, they may not be mating. And you know there are a lot of ramifications that we don't think about that have to do with the street lights and the lights that we have on around our house. So anyway, when you're thinking about all these good things, the vitality will abound in your yard and you're going to feel it. You're gonna feel the difference. So these are just some questions to ask yourself to create a sense of comfort in your yard. Does your garden have a sense of refuge? Does it allow you to, to connect to your community if that's what you want? Some people like that, some don't. Comfortable spots to sit in in each season. A place to put your drink. These are simple things. Edibles close at hand for easy harvest. Edibles that are safe to eat directly from the garden. So if you, you're in your garden or your children or your grandchildren are in your garden and there's a ripe strawberry, you can just pick it and eat it without worries. Habitat for wildlife special areas you can see from indoors and um, have you created a happy feeling between where you get out of your car and where you enter your home. Just setting the tone for your home life in a way that feels really good. And if you look at this picture on the left, just look at all the things they have packed into this really small area, but it doesn't feel overdone. It just feels wonderful. 
So they've got two chairs, they've got a table in between those chairs, they've got a fire pit, they've got that ball shaped thing is, I believe it's a fountain. Then you can see there is in the back a sculpture and all this texture and all those beautiful plants. You see that grass-like plant, you see these big leaves of a, a canna lily, you see this variegated little tree above the sculpture, just all kinds of stuff and the paving underneath that makes it feel like a little garden room. Here's another example on the, the right hand side, you can see this is between two houses that they have actually taken advantage of every little bit of space where normally that just might be a dirt path where the somebody keeps their garbage cans and they have just decided they're going to maximize their pleasure and made this little spot very personal to them with the, the architectural elements at the front and the bench at the back and all these little plants that are crammed in there. It's probably really shady in there. So you see things like hostas and ferns back in there. And here on the, on the left-hand side, here's another uh, just beautiful garden. And just I'm just trying to break apart the elements for you so that you can see them and think about how you might add them to your own garden. This is another side yard. So the house is over here on the far left. You can barely see it, but they've got a little gate, the blue gate at the end and this paved pathway curving through this side yard. I see at least one, two, maybe three different pieces of pottery that are kind of leading you through the garden. And this brick type structure at the front that I think has a a bell or something in there. Um, and you can also see in this garden that they've staggered evergreens. So there's um, at least three evergreens that I can see, a, one on one side and two on the other side of the pathway. And then it looks like a big giant vine is growing over the top of the fence and the gate at the far side. You also see that they've got these, um, these spires of flowers that are repeated, just kind of leading you through the garden, that's foxglove. And um, here's another little design that's just amazing. On the right-hand side, this is from the Telegraph, but look how small their yard is. And they have got window boxes on the upper story of the house. They've got a little greenhouse where inside they have plants, but they also have a place to eat. They've got rain barrels. They've got their compost bin. They've got this little nice round patch of grass that's actually blocked off so they could feel a little private in there. And they've got pathways leading to various beds. They've got a, a flower garden. They've got a vegetable garden. They've even got a little um, very small water garden squeezed in there along with the shed. It looks like the shed has a green roof. I mean, they've got it going, y'all. And then this, um, this other slide on the left hand, just, just look at how having those lights overhead, how that kind of creates a ceiling and a feeling of coziness that you wouldn't have if those lights weren't there. And just the pleasure of eating outside in the summertime. So I'm just a big proponent of being yourself, whatever that is, okay? We're all gonna be different. We're all gonna have different things that speak to us. And we're gonna have um, a varying uh, desire of how much time we wanna spend in the garden as well. So you wanna be a little realistic about that. So formal versus loose and wild evergreens versus flowers. So if basically you just have evergreen plants, you're really not gonna to have to do very much at all. You're gonna to have to do a little maintenance through the year, but as far as um, seasonal maintenance, you're not gonna to have to do that much. Color versus calming, let's say you love orange and your whole garden is orange or you just love every color in the world and you have every color in the world. 
or maybe you just have a white garden and that's very, very calming and quieting. Straight versus curvy, we've seen in these slides that we've been looking at, some of the pathways are straight, some are curved. I think if you, um, it, I think it depends on your objective um, and your overall design, what's gonna best fit. Restful versus boisterous, that kind of goes back to the really colorful garden versus just white flowers, say. Modern, think about that bench we were looking at a few slides ago. Very sort of simple. Some, some of the modern plantings I've seen are just a row of grasses and a gravel floor and a bench and that's it. That, and, but it, it, or maybe it's um, boxwood balls in planters. Very simple, but really fits the architecture. Or English country where it's just exuberant flowers everywhere. Um, <laughs> and if you, I, I know a lot of us, myself included, last year I expen expanded my edible garden. I had been planning to put a, an additional pollinator garden there and I decided to plant vegetables there. And the thing that is so nice is actually having access to those fresh vegetables, to having tomatoes that I picked out of my yard, peppers that I picked out of my yard, lettuce, potatoes, all kinds of yummy, yummy things and lots of herbs too. So you, you might want to focus it. You may want a salad garden. You might want an herb garden. Some people grow cocktail gardens just for um, fun. I also love it when people have incorporated into their yard plants that make them think about someone who was special in their lives or a place that they were really drawn to or a place that has special memories for them. We went on a garden tour a few years ago and um, Mary Filet has a very large garden kind of near UNCA and she had so many sentimental things incorporated into her garden. Her family was from I think South Georgia and they had grown cotton so she had some cotton that she had planted just as a sort of a shout out to her family. She had a flower bed named after one of her aunts who had had some particular influence on her. She had all these little things tucked in and around that made her garden personal to her. Cutting gardens, I personally love to go out in my yard and cut flowers. And I think if you, if you also love to cut flowers, think about the things that you're planting, not just the flowers themselves, think about the trees and shrubs too, because you're always gonna need greenery and you're gonna, you could, and you also wanna think through the year. If you're doing a cutting garden, you're gonna wanna think that you always have something blooming so that you can always go out in your yard and find something that you can pick and bring inside. And of course, we've sort of talked already about wildlife and pollinator gardens, but all of these things really br bring a lot of pleasure and they bring the wildlife into your yard so that you can also enjoy it, not just doing good for them, but they bring you pleasure seeing them. So this is an Instagram post that I did. And I, this is what I said. You think you like a wild and woolly garden and then you visit Charleston and all you want is a walled hidden garden. Love is fickle. So much green, so much texture on the ground, iron and bricks, flickering gas lanterns, Spanish moss, resurrection fern. It's the complete opposite of what my garden is, but I so fell in love with it and wanted it. And it's not the first time I've seen it. It just reminded me. So I have to ask myself, are there ways that I could have it all incorporate the wild pollinator garden and this sort of formal feeling of this, of some of these Charleston gardens, because I love that too. And my mother's family's from New Orleans. So that New Orleans courtyard is just something that I find very appealing. 
So here's another example of, this is a more formal yard on the left-hand side. You can see those clipped boxwoods, this pathway, the furniture itself is um, defining a little bit about this garden. It has a certain vibe. Uh, you can see in the background, there's a retaining wall that is um, holding some of that, that garden back. And they've used elements like pottery in here. Um, in, the, in the garden on the right, the thing that struck me about it is if you take away that arbor from that garden, try to take it away visually and see how different that whole yard feels. It just feels entirely different. That arbor adds so much. And the two pots in front of the arbor just underscore that the arbor is there. You could have just the two pots and that creates a bit of an entryway, but that arbor just super kicks it up a notch. Winter, um, I let me check on our time. Ooh. Wait, I, okay, I'm gonna need to speed up people, sorry. So winter helps you to figure out what's missing and what you might do to make your garden more pleasurable because you want your winter garden, the winter garden is the bones of your garden. And um, so that's gonna be the, the evergreens that you've planted, the hardscaping, the fences, the trellises, any lighting you've created, pottery, um, porch pots, all of those things are really gonna show up. So check out your evergreens, see how they feel, check out your curb appeal in winter, and think of those evergreens as the bones of your landscape. Think about the shapes of them, balls, tall, skinny, triangles. Think about the colors. Is it light green? Is it dark green? Is it blue, like blue spruce or Arizona cypress? Um, some of my evergreens turn color in winter. And really think about where you've got your evergreens placed and also think about what you may wanna screen out. And you can do that. I have, it, I'll just explain this. Let's say you have two people and you're, you have a far off something that you're trying to put something, a piece of hedge in to block or even just one plant. If you get on your phones and you have somebody out in the yard and some with a bamboo pole and someone inside, you can say, okay, move over two feet, move over three feet um, and kind of estimate how tall that thing needs to be to block out what you're not wanting to see and make a plan that way. So always be thinking about the color, texture, the size, the ultimate size. So. Green Giant Arborvitae, for instance, is an evergreen that gets 40 feet tall, but you might buy it in a three gallon pot and it's only two and a half feet tall. So you really need to imagine the future. And also you wanna make sure that even if you love, love, love the plant, if it's not suitable for that particular place, it's not gonna thrive. So say you have a really shady yard, but you want a blue spruce that wants full sun, you need to find a puddle of sunshine for that blue spruce or find a different plant that you could put in there that will make you just as happy, hopefully. And plants that um, look great in the winter, red twig dogwood, the bark of crepe myrtles, hairy lauder walking stick, witch hazel, hellebores, a per, it's a perennial that's evergreen, mm -hmm. coral bells, evergreen ferns like Christmas fern and auto, um, autumn fern, bark and even the movement of things like grasses in the wind in winter. Oftentimes people leave their grass up so that they will have that winter interest. And the other thing to think about is container gardens that are near your entry. Think about, especially in the winter, consider your entryway because things are going to be more bare bones at that time. So this is a quick example um, of what this person has done on the left with lighting and how that lighting really warms up that house. 
I don't particularly like this um, garden. It feels like a fortress to me, but I thought that the, um, the example of how lighting can really contribute beautifully um, to your garden. On the right-hand side, my, that's my stepdaughter's garden. And when they moved into this house, it was just one big flat black backyard. They wanted to have a vegetable garden. So they fenced it off, but they also added some features to this fencing. They've added this big arbor and this really sweet gate that they built. And on, she loves um, New Dawn Rose. So that is what is crawling all over that arbor. But this adds so much to her garden all year long, the structure. It is a little more expensive to build structure. So you wanna think about it, but it really contributes so much to her yard. So I'm gonna to try to speed it up. I'm sorry, I'm running behind. Uh, style thoughts, open welcoming arms versus secret garden. In other words, when you drive up, can you kind of see the whole thing? And it's almost like, come on in, we're here, we're, we're here for you. Or is it sort of closed off and you have to go through a garden gate to get inside the front yard? Which one speaks um, more strongly to you? Evergreen hedges that you screen you from the street or screening unwanted views. For instance, I have some perfectly lovely neighbors in, the, in my back, but I don't really want to see their cars and I'm strategizing how I can plant a few evergreens so that when I look in my backyard, I'm not looking a little further into where they park their cars. Hardscaping that can really pull a garden together and really help your curb appeal. Um, think about when you're gonna be out there now. These days with coronavirus, we're outside a lot more than we used to be, but if you, were, if you weren't working at home, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little different, but pretend like there's no coronavirus. If everyone has gone to work and you're mostly out in your yard at night, that's something to consider. You may wanna plant more white flowers that are gonna show up in the evening light and in the light of the moon. So think about your year round pleasure. Think about who's the star. So if you have, you're creating a new flower bed, for instance, um, first thing you would wanna think about is, is there something I need to block out and think about where that plant's gonna go? And the other thing to think about is, who's gonna be the star of the show in this particular area? Because you can't really have two stars of the show or they're, they're competing too much. You can create mystery with gates and arbors and curving pathways so that you're just enticing yourself and your guests to wanna to see what's around the corner and what's through that gate and what, what's on the other side of the arbor. I do think it's important to, to plan areas for children to play and to climb trees. So that's probably going to be some grassy areas and also your pets. You may have wanna have an area for your pets, but I do think you, you probably wanna devote at least some portion of your yard for a play area if children are involved in your life. And the other thing is, don't forget about indoors. There's, you can add so much to your indoor enjoyment with house plants. They bring cleaner air and also by cutting flower arrangements and bringing them inside. For instance, right now I've got paper whites blooming. Okay, here's just some speeding through this. Just a beautiful little sitting area with a nice fire pit. Four gates, I love every single one of them. So I would have to say one, which one do I like the best? Which one fits my vibe the most? Which one can I afford? Which one could I make myself? The only one I could make myself would be the wooden one that's in the lower right-hand corner. But um, maybe I would splurge for the occasion of something that was really going to set the tone for my garden. Now this garden on the, on the right-hand side is very formal and you can see that it has two grade changes. It steps up and then it steps up again to this nice oval shaped patch of grass where they've got this beautiful sitting area toward their house 
And then they've got this beautiful patch of grass surrounded by lots of lovely plantings. And here's an example of how much you can, how much you can improve someplace. I just think this transformation is awesome. And one of the things they've added here that I think is important to point out is that they've added this deck to the back. So all of a sudden they have a nice, comfortable place to sit. It's gonna, it looks kind of like it's a little wet in that backyard. So they have a comfortable place to sit where they can hang out and enjoy the garden that they have planted around their boardwalk. A garden is far more than a much loved physical space. It's also a mental space, one that gives you quiet so you can hear your thoughts. When you work with your hands in the garden, weeding or clipping, you free your mind to work through, to work through feelings and problems. By tending your plants, you're also gardening your inner space. And over time, the garden is woven into your sense of identity becoming a place to buffer us when the going gets tough. Sue Stewart Smith. Here's another example. This one on the right is a wonderful garden in Montford that was on the garden tour. The owner, the, the couple that owns the house, the man ha happens to be a stonemason and he built this awesome sculpture in the yard. This is a very small lot that is almost completely covered with plant material. It's quite inspiring. And then this picture on the, the left-hand side just shows you again, look at how um, the attention to detail on the top of that fence, the fact that there's a bell, this curving pathway that leads you into the garden, past the birdhouse, where you know there's wildlife flitting around. And this is by another gardener, Umberto Pasti. He's an Italian gardener. This is a picture in his Moroccan garden. When I make a garden for myself, it is the only time in my life when I allow myself to become a child. I don't hide anything. I don't want to prove anything. I want to allow myself the most possible joy and the most possible invention. It's just love, fun, and enjoy myself. Love, fun, and invention, and oneness with nature. So just be yourself, figure out what's going to make you smile and make you feel happy and embrace what that is. And remember the outdoors is where your ancient self is most at home. So get outside and feel happier, healthier, and more fulfilled. Thank you so much for coming today. I wish I could see all of your faces to say hello, but I hope we'll see you around Reams Creek Nursery. We're getting geared up for spring. We're gonna be getting our fruit orders starting to come in pretty soon. And after that, things start going crazy. So we hope you'll come and visit us. We love what we do. We love um, helping people figure out what plant might work in their situation. And we welcome your visit. And I just wanna thank you all for coming today. I wanna to thank Jamie and the library for having me. And I hope y'all have a great gardening year. Ruth, thank you so much for this wonderful program. This is just a total delight. Um, I know I certainly wanna get outside and start uh, giving myself the most possible joy, especially on a day like this when it's um, just warm and sunshiny in the middle of February. We do have a cup, uh, three questions in our q and I'm hoping you wouldn't mind sticking around for about five minutes here and we can um, answer these folks' questions. I'd be happy to do that. Wonderful. Um, the first question is from Jean, and I believe this pertains to the beginning of your presentation. How is this considered an anti-cancer effect? I believe we're talking about just being outside and in nature at that point. I honestly, I would have to dive into the, um, I, I don't know that I can feel like I have at my fingertips the answer to that question. I know that um, getting, you know, 
being having less stress would certainly contribute to your general overall health. So I don't know that it's saying it's going to cure cancer, but maybe it helps prevent cancer, just because you're in a more a, a better, um, you're less stressed out, so all of your systems are in better working order. I'm taking a guess at that. I'm just let I'm saying disclaimer. I'm taking a guess at that answer. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Margaret here. She asks, how do you decide when to start planting outside? I live in Fairview and have always been told that the long-term folks say that after Mother's Day and not sooner, I feel like I have seen a few different last frost dates. Okay, so that's a really good question. And I think it pertains to different types of plants. So first I would say, I'm not talking about vegetables right now. Um, that you can plant anything, any time of year, as long as the ground isn't frozen. And when I'm saying that, I'm pretty much talking about trees, shrubs, and perennials. Now, if you bought a perennial right now, it's going to probably look like it went to sleep unless it's a hellebore or a coral bell or something like that. But I have planted perennials in the middle of winter and just thought, well, let's see what happens and was so pleasantly surprised. When it comes to vegetables and annual flowers, I do agree that Mother's Day is the date to wait for, unless you're a chance taker. And if you're a chance taker, you might try planting your tomatoes and some of those things a little earlier. You might be ready to go out there with some kind of covering if the frost should come. I know one year around here, um, I used to farm and a bunch of my farmer friends had tomatoes that got frosted something like the 25th of May, but I wouldn't wait that long. I would absolutely get, that's, that was a freak year. So I would wait with the vegetables and the annual flowers, unless you happen to know that they're, um, all right, let me backtrack. For the vegetables, I'm talking about tomatoes and peppers and those kind of hot weather vegetables. For early vegetables like um, lettuce and greens and spin uh, spinach and all of those broccoli, those kind of vegetables can be planted much earlier. And you can also give them protection. For instance, at Reams Creek, we've got these um, fiberglass rods that you can make a little tunnel and then you put floating row cover on top of it and that protects what's under it from frost. So um, absolutely you could plant the cool season vegetables sooner, the warm season vegetables you want to wait till Mother's Day. You could plant cool season annual flowers like pansies earlier, but you would want to wait later to plant warm season flowers like zinnias. Great. Um, and a, a follow up question from Margaret. When starting a new bed, what cheap ways can you add to the soil to get the soil some quick boosts? Get the soil some quick what? Boosts. Oh, well, I'll tell you what I do. Um, but did she say cheap? Yes. I don't know about cheap. Okay. But um, <laughs> let's let me think about that for a second. I mean, it's to me, it's kind of cheap. It, it might depend on if you're in a rental or if you own your home, but that I've, I um, expanded my pollinator garden last year and I'm not kidding you, the ground was awful. It was such hard clay, such hard clay, such hard clay. And I pretty much amended it 50-50 with compost. That was my goal. So I bought a bunch of 50 pound bags of compost and I would turn a certain area and then I would turn that compost into it. And I actually even removed some of the clay, like I had a bucket around. And if it was a, a, a dirt clod of clay that was like a brick, I just put it in the bucket and then I hauled that off somewhere. And so, um, because it, I think it depends on your, your soil, but the soil really does make a difference. My garden, the last the place I lived before this, my vegetable garden was at the bottom of the hill. And 
I think topsoil had been washing down that hill for so long that I could pretty much turn that garden any time. I didn't have to wait for it, to, the ground to dry out. But most gardens I've had around here, I've had to be careful about um, turning my soil when the ground was too wet. So I would, I would amend it because it's a long-term investment, even though it costs money. You can also cover crop it, um, but you'd have to be on it with the cover crop. And that I, that's probably cheaper, but you would wanna do multiple cover crops. So you'd be having to wait for, you couldn't, you'd, you'd want a few years of cover cropping to get that benefit. Um, thank you. And we have one final question here. Um, uh, uh, when should you start seed germination of vegetables? It depends on who it is. You could certainly start uh, probably any of your cool season transplants right now. Um, it's not on the top of my head when to start um, tomatoes. I might have something I can look at though. Let me see. But it's later because you're not going to put your tomatoes out unless you've got a lot of room where you could keep that tomato growing on in a pot, but you're going to have to give it lots and lots of light. So that's always. Um... Okay, hold on. I think you're going to want to maybe even wait until April. So I would say April, maybe late March for, um, for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those kind of things. Um, unless you have a special situation where you've got plenty of room that you can keep them as warm as they wanna be and with plenty of bright light. Right. Well, those are all the questions in our Q&A. Thank you so much for this lovely afternoon. What, what perfect weather for a program like this. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see y'all.